It's nice to be able to join you at the Australian Institute for International Affairs. Uh, I have, uh, sorry that I cannot be with you uh, in person, but uh, the new technologies will perhaps uh, at least allow us to share some ideas uh, as a way to help you with your conference on smart power capabilities of a middle power. Let me start by uh, saying something about what do I mean by smart power. For me, smart power is the combination of hard and soft power into successful strategies. Or as our Secretary of State Hillary Clinton once put it, it's uh, using all the tools in your power toolbox. Perhaps more difficult is the concept of smart of soft power, um, which is something that uh, a term that I invented about 20 years ago. And the idea of soft power was to refer to a dimension, I thought, of international affairs that was not uh, attended to adequately at the time. It's not new, but it wasn't uh, one that we were thinking much about when we spoke about power. It's interesting to see that an academic uh, concept that was uh, developed uh, two decades ago uh, is now being used by political leaders in the United States. Uh, uh, even Hu Jintao, uh, the president of China, uh, told the 17th Party Congress of the Chinese Communist Party in 2007 that China needed to increase its soft power. And indeed, China is spending billions of dollars on a variety of efforts to increase their soft power. Now, what do I mean by power? Power is simply the ability to affect others uh, to get the outcomes you want. And there are basically three ways you can do that. You can do it with uh, uh, sticks uh, and coercion. Uh, you can do it with uh, carrots, uh, payments. Or you can do it with attraction and persuasion. And that ability to get the outcomes you want without coercion or payment is what I mean by soft power. Now, soft power is uh, not in and of itself uh, uh, sufficient to solve problems. And that's why I talk about smart power, the ability to combine hard and soft power into uh, successful strategies. But if we think about uh, uh, soft power and hard power, uh, each of them depend upon resources. And it's important not to mistake the resources for the power behavior. Remember I said that power is the ability to get the to affect others to get the outcomes you want. If you have massive resources, that may give you uh, those outcomes you want, but it may not. Take, uh, if we think of military power, uh, imagine a country that has 10,000 uh, main battle tanks and another that has 1,000. Uh, we tend to think that country A is 10 times stronger than country B because it has 10 times the amount of resources. That's not necessarily true. It might be true if the battle is in a desert, but if the battle is in a swamp, it might turn out just the other way around. Indeed, that's what the Americans found out in Vietnam. Now, the same thing is true with the resources that produce soft power. Uh, we often say that soft power is based on the resources of culture, where it's attractive in the eyes of others, uh, or it's based on uh, uh, values, when a country lives up to its values, or it may be based on policies, when those policies are seen as legitimate in the eyes of others. But the fact that your culture is a potential resource uh, for producing soft power doesn't guarantee it any more than the fact that tanks can win a battle, but not always. So it's important to keep resources, their potential sources of power, separate in your mind from the behavior, which is the ability to get the outcomes you want. Now, why is that important? Well, for example, if you look at some of the things that you listed on your agenda, um, they are potential there are resources that are potential sources of hard and soft power, but whether they produce it or not depends upon the context. Uh, let's think for a second of military uh, uh, units. We can say, well, military units obviously produce hard power. Uh, they 
fight and win and prevail in coercing an opponent. That's true. Military units can produce hard power. They can also produce soft power. For example, if you use your military units to provide uh, assistance, or let's say tsunami relief, as happened with Indonesia in 2004 or 5, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the military units can actually produce soft power. In that particular case, the United States, which uh, had a, a uh, public opinion poll show the United States was attractive to something like uh, 75 percent of Indonesians in the year 2000. But then after George W. Bush invaded Iraq without a UN resolution uh, to justify it or legitimize it, the uh, attractiveness of the United States, according to polls in Indonesia, went down to a mere 15 percent in the uh, spring of 2003. But what's interesting is that after American naval units uh, were used for tsunami relief in 2004-05, uh, polls showed the United States going back up to about 40 percent to 45 percent attractiveness. So that's an example of where a hard power, or not a hard power, a, a military resource produced not hard power but produced soft power. And that should be true in terms of any size country. I mean, that's, that would be true for Australia as it thinks about its capabilities for, for using various resources to produce power. Now, in the uh, uh, little piece of paper that was sent to me about the agenda for your conference, uh, there was a question about what are some of the instruments for, the, uh, for a mid-power to punch above its weight, uh, to be successful in getting the outcomes it wants in a manner that's disproportional to its actual size in terms of resources. Um, let me give you the example of Norway. Uh, Norway is smaller than Australia, much smaller. Uh, it's a member of NATO, but not of the European Union. Uh, it has oil, but uh, not a language which is widely uh, spoken. Uh, and it nonetheless has a reputation internationally, which is larger than the scale of its resources. What causes that? Well, there are several resources. One is Norway uh, is a well-ordered democracy. People admire the way Norway runs itself. Uh, that has a degree of attraction. In other words, it lives up to its values. Norway also uh, is one of the few countries that actually devotes 1 percent of its GDP to overseas development assistance. And uh, that, again, is attractive to numbers. Norway is often a supporter of multilateral institutions uh, in its role in the UN uh, and also in its uh, involvement in various uh, peacekeeping operations and peace mediation operations. Remember the Oslo process at, in the Middle East at one point. All these types of activities tend to give Norway a degree of outcomes that are greater than the amount of resources that one would expect from the country of that size. Australia, of course, is uh, many times larger than Norway, and Australia has a considerable potential. Think of Australian culture, at least in the eyes of Americans, we think of Australia as very much like us in terms of a robust democracy, perhaps sometimes uh, too much so, as we demonstrate. Uh, also, Australia is a country which has, a, uh, in its culture, uh, an attractiveness, I think, to others as a, as a well-run uh, society. Uh, Australia's economic success is also a, another source of soft power. So as you think about the various resources that can be used from Australian soft power, uh, Australia's the way it runs itself and its values, uh, Australia's uh, economy and economic success, and Australia's uh, uh, military forces, which can be used for peacekeeping or humanitarian purposes as well as for uh, war fighting. Uh, all these are potential resources for soft power in Australia. But it's worth noticing that we sometimes spend too much effort on government aspects of soft power. 
I would argue that a lot of soft power of a country is produced by its civil society. Uh, sometimes I've said that uh, if you ask what are the sources of American soft power, it comes more from everything in civil society ranging from Harvard to Hollywood uh, rather than the necessarily government policies or programs. Yes, aid programs can be useful and important, but sometimes aid programs that are poorly managed uh, don't produce soft power. Uh, similarly, government broadcasts and efforts to uh, uh, appeal to other so-called hearts and minds programs uh, may be successful, but they may not be. If they're seen as propagandistic and not credible, then they don't produce soft power. So a lot of government programs uh, is not necessarily the answer to producing soft power. A free and vibrant civil society, both a business society and in the private sector and a non-profit sector, uh, those can be uh, equally or even more important because what they have is credibility. As one young uh, uh, Czech uh, student during Cold War days that I quote in my new book, The Future of Power, said, the best propaganda is not propaganda. And that's a lesson that China hasn't yet learned. China is spending billions of dollars on trying to turn CCTV and Xinhua into the Al Jazeera's of the, of the uh, Far East. Uh, but there's not that much of a market for brittle propaganda. China has to learn to let go and use more of the creative capacities of its civil society if it's going to be able to do that. Look at uh, China versus India, for example, in cinema. Um, India's Bollywood reaches vast audiences internationally. They produce more films than Hollywood. Uh, China doesn't, and it's not because Indian directors or actors are that much better than Chinese directors or actors. It's because India doesn't spend the effort censoring uh, its, its movie industry that China does. So in that sense, credibility, the sense of, of, of an open society and the ability to speak frankly can prove to be as important for soft power and thereby smart power as the ability to just pour money into something. So as you have your deliberations over, over the next days and looking at the various instruments for producing soft power and what the role of government should be and can be, just remember that it's, that it's the ability to be credible in the eyes of others that makes you attractive and persuasive. And that attraction and persuasion also has to be matched with your hard economic and military power in ways that reinforce each other rather than cancel each other out. And when you pull that off, then you have smart power. And I wish you well on your deliberations in producing a good smart power strategy for Australia.